ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to talk about Section C405, Electrical Power and Lighting Systems of the IECC 2018 Commercial Lighting Code. Uh, my name is Dylan Agnes. I'm a research scientist here at the Integrated Design Lab, University of Idaho. Uh, this is being sponsored by NIA, the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. Uh, if you do come in person, we have coffee and bagels. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. There we go. So we are here. Uh, so what is the purpose of energy cuts? Uh, it's to set the minimum requirement for energy efficiency standards uh, kind of across the board, uh, as well as renovations uh, for existing buildings so that we can bring them up to par uh, and uh, track the energy use and emissions for the, uh, the life of the building uh, by reducing it. So uh, 2018, uh, effective January 1st, or sorry, effective January 1st, 2021, uh, IECC uh, 2018 went to effect for Idaho. Uh, the estimated savings is to be 140 million by 2030. So uh, as far as lighting is concerned, these are the emerging lighting control strategies in the market. Um, we derive these from the CBEX, the Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey, uh, as well as just what manufacturers are developing for their products. Uh, one that is becoming out of date is the demand response lighting. Uh, so reduces lighting by dimming or turning off lights at peak uh, electricity uh, pricing. So that's typically uh, manufacturing. However, there's a new uh, commercial aspect of it um, because of luminar level lighting controls. So that's where sensors are integrated into the lights and the lights come on as occupancy is sensed and uh, dims and or turns off as it's not detected anymore. So a literal on demand. Uh, but based off of occupant presence, not um, electricity um, pricing. So there might have to be a subcategory for that. Uh, speaking of CBEX, uh, this is how we track uh, what type of uh, strategies are being implemented in buildings, um, both envelope and control strategies. Uh, so you can see that occupancy sensors and light scheduling uh, remain the most popular. Um, and that's because of the rate of return for them uh, for their commercial uh, floor space. So less than 20%, about 18%, I wanna say, uh, use occupancy sensors, but it accounts for about 45% of commercial building floor space, okay? So that, that's key for um, lighting control strategies. We go off of the kilowatt hour pool that's available. Um, that's how we determine our rate of return. Uh, and then of the lighting types, uh, this was very pleasant to see. Uh, that every single lighting category except LED saw a reduction. Uh, LED saw an increase from 9 to 44%. Um, however, standard fluorescent and compact fluorescent um, still kind of hold the lion's share of the market. Uh, the reason for that being um, retrofits, older buildings just needing to bring uh, buildings up to par for using LED systems and converting those. Uh, and the conversion and retrofit market has really um, come alive and is really vibrant. Um, so I imagine, I imagine it's only a matter of time before um, LEDs over, overtake uh, as the leader in the market. So uh, how do we get here? Uh, standards or codes uh, impact the market by creating demand that must be met with new practices or technologies from the built environment and its practitioners. Uh, the practice of lighting design has made a resurgent in recent decades where both daylighting and electric lighting are considered for building and space types. However, that is now back on the decline. Um, that's mostly due to LEDs. Uh, I won't get into that today. Uh, but an example of the market responding to code requirements is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, luminary level lighting controls, or LLLC is the acronym we used. Uh, it's a direct result of the energy code requirements becoming stricter and more, I guess I would say, complicated. Um, and so it's a response from the manufacturers to the clients basically say, if you use this lighting product, it will meet all code requirements now and in the future. That is the minimum standard of LLC, is that it will be completely code requirement and above. So you can go the bare minimum and above. And if it's not that, it doesn't qualify as an LLC product. So if you don't, uh, as far as uh, what considers an LLC, there's two definitions. There's the code definition and then there's a the market definition. The market definition is controlled by IES, the Illuminating Engineering Society. Uh, they're kind of the gatekeepers of lighting. They come up with the standards, codes, and requirements for lighting controls. 
Uh, they also have an agreement with the manufacturers for lighting. So they have a, a sub program called the Design Light uh, Consortium, uh, DLC. And they have what they call is a qualified products list, QPL. And so basically lighting products have to meet a certain standard or threshold of requirement to be on that list. And so LLCs is one of those, those standards that they have. So if your lighting product or you're being sold a lighting product and the lighting cut sheet doesn't have the QLP DLC sticker on it, then it's not LLC according to code. And it has to be in order for you to take advantage of code compliance as well as incentive programs. So um, basically lighting control specified uh, in sections 40521 to 26, uh, it has to comply with all those. The manufacturer guarantees that it does. It has the uh, program software capability of doing that. But in addition, it shall be independently capable of, i.e. the occupant can override those controls and interact with the light on a demand basis to do the following, which is basically a three bullet point summary of the lighting code section. Okay. So the cycle kind of works like this. We have the market research products that we put out. We have CBEX to evaluate them, uh, to determine where we are going, so to speak, what is our heading, whether we are using more energy, less energy, um, how that's being uh, categorized. Uh, and then we have the energy codes and standards in response to kind of correct or accelerate um, that course trajectory. And then the market response again, and around and around we go. Uh, so some terminology that's used in the code, I'm only gonna go over a handful here. Excuse me. Uh, if I were to put every single terminology you need to you to know in the code, it would be the entire presentation. Okay, so I'm just gonna pull out a handful. Um, I do recommend uh, section 202. Um, that's basically the glossary, it's in the front. And then if you need to locate any of those key terms, you have the index that's in the back right before the residential section. And that tells you exactly where that word or phrase uh, is mentioned in the code, um, which section to look up. Okay, uh, so there is a roadmap for navigating code, although it can be a little strenuous at times. So uh, terminology lamp is an important one. Uh, it kind of refers to what we would call a light bulb. Okay, so even though LEDs have diodes, diodes, however you want to pronounce it, we still refer to them as lamps. Okay, even though there's a series or linear row of diodes in there, that's one lamp. Okay. Um, that mostly comes from uh, fluorescent fixtures and incandescence on how we op operated, manufactured, and maintained them. Uh, but it includes LED, incandescent, fluorescent, metal, metal halogen, um, low, low sodium, high sodium, uh, as well as specialty sources. Uh, another one is lighting power density. You'll see it as LPD quite frequently. Uh, it's the maximum watts per square foot of lighting for a general building type or a specific building uh, space. Uh, there are certain tables that correlate it depending on if you're doing billing type or if you're doing uh, the space by space uh, method. Each one has their own benefits. Uh, when I say luminaire, referring to the entire light fixture. So everything, the bulb, the housing, the ballast, uh, everything that's designed within it. So luminaire is the entire fixture. Uh, another one that's kind of convoluted is dwelling unit. So this references the residential energy portion of it. I'm not gonna go over that. I will go over what happens when you have a multifamily building um, that is technically commercial, but you have dwelling units, R2 um, categorization. Um, there is one caveat you have to do with it. So for understanding code, code is written in a logic format. Okay, there are, for our intents and purposes, what we're gonna talk about, we're just gonna go over two of those logics formal and informal. Formal being the science of de uh, deductively valid inferences or uh, local truths. Uh, basically do A, then B happens. Uh, and then there's also informal logic, which basically means critical thinking or your best uh, judgment in the, in the context of the situation. So uh, pretty much I like to think of it as an if-then statement, a hypothesis. If I have this LPD, then I am compliant. Or if not, then I need to reduce by X amount of watts per square foot to become compliant. That's kind of the checks and balances when you uh, move through the logic part of code. So uh, as I was saying, it's basically written in a logic-based format. Uh, in simple terms, we're solving a logic puzzle. I don't know how many of you enjoy logic puzzles, but 
I do. Um, I think they're quite fun. This is one of them. Um, and so basically we arrive at the conclusion of compliance. Are we in compliance? If not, how far out of compliance are we? Um, they come in very uh, different types. Okay, so there's not just one logic puzzle in the code. There are different logic puzzles and they all work together, but they all arrive at the same place. So here's all the subsections for C405. Uh, I'm gonna go over all of them. I've broken the lecture into two parts. So for this part, we're only gonna go over C405.2. Um, the second half is gonna go over the remaining sections, uh, mostly focusing on point three to point five. I can go over point six to point nine if it's um, demanded. Um, but for the most part, uh, you mechanical or architectural designers will not be using that part of the code. That's mostly electrical engineers or electricians. So but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. So mandatory lighting controls. Lighting systems shall be provided with the controls that comply with one of the following. One, go through section 405.2.1 to 405.2.6. Or, as I mentioned earlier, luminary level lighting controls. And so. I'm going to keep coming back to luminary level, level lighting controls to show you how they simplify the process of code compliance. So exceptions to that. Uh, areas designated as security or emergency areas that are required to be continuously lighted. There's our first informal bit of logic right off the bat. Uh, code does not define security or emergency area. So that's up to you, depending on your building type, context of the situation, and what your client is going to be using uh, the spaces for. Uh, interior exit ways, interior exit ramps, and exit passageways, uh, emergency egress lighting that is normally off. So that doesn't mean you, there are no controls there. It means they are being controlled independently of our general lighting um, characteristics. So uh, here's everything we're going to go over. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, occupancy sensor controls. So occupancy sensor is broken down into three sections. We have what is an occupancy sensor. Uh, the control functions, and then there are special cases uh, in warehouses and open office uh, layouts. So uh, they shall be installed to control lights in the following space types. So here's that list for you. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, um, and it correlates with the space-by-space -space method, uh, if you're curious. Uh, the main caveat is that other spaces 300 square feet or less that are enclosed by floor-to-ceiling height partitions. Okay. This is meant to kind of envelop all the random rooms that we have, mechanical, electrical, janitorial, storage, laundry, things like that. Or something that's been converted to a washroom that wouldn't normally be a washroom, things like that. Uh, occupancy or motion sensors. So the code really doesn't mention vacancy sensors anymore. That kind of has gone away. And now you can kind of just think of vacancy as occupancy, but it's kind of a sub uh, routine of the program um, that it can do. Uh, so automatically uh, controls devices that detect occupancy to adjust light in response to presence or the absence of occupants in a space. So there are uh, four different types, uh, the two common being passive infrared and ultrasonic. Uh, passive infrared is probably uh, the one that's merging uh, more frequently, uh, especially if we want to get into smart thermostats and smart uh, HVAC uh, cooling uh, heating loads. Um, but ultrasonic is just as frequent, but uh, more so is you're going to find a dual technology. Uh, it's kind of a way to use both of them, and both uh, both sensors have to be tripped. Uh, it prevents uh, false triggers, because we all remember when you know you would stand up and just wave your hands, and you know lights would come back on, even though you're still in the room. Uh, so the redundancy, in my opinion, is important because uh, we don't want to annoy our occupants or make the space difficult to use, because if we do, they will override our energy efficiency uh, control strategies, and that's a whole other problem. Uh, microwave, uh, I'm not going to get into that. But that's mostly security and alarm systems. I don't think anyone will be dealing with that too much. Uh, but the code does not specify which technologies are acceptable. So you choose your sensor. Um, it determines the location and performance expectations. And when I say location, I mean space type. The code doesn't tell you you have to have your occupancy sensor three feet from the doorway. It doesn't, uh, probably the only exception to that is if you have an occupancy sensor built into a light switch, you are told where to put the light switch. Plus building occupants have a uh, ex expectation that the light switch is readily accessible when they walk in, which also trips the occupancy sensor. So, uh, one of the performance uh, expectations that you're going to see throughout the code, no matter what section you're complying with with occupancy sensors, 
is that all of them have a maximum of 20 minute time delay. So it can't go more than 20 minutes since the last trigger happened. Um, depending on the settings and the type of occupancy sensor uh, you choose, it will affect your energy efficiency. So uh, you will save more energy using a narrow field of view programmed into the occupancy sensor versus a wide one. The reason being is if someone walks by a space and they're just walking by and not, they don't plan on entering it, and the occupancy sensor detects their motion, it's going to turn on, those lights are going to go on for at least 20 minutes as they keep on walking by. So with a narrow field of view, that happens less often. So someone has to actually break the plane and enter the space in order for that to trigger. Uh, nowadays, most occupancy sensors are digital. I'll get into analog versus digital later on, uh, but you can program them to go from wide to narrow, depending on your need, as well as uh, changing the delay. So if the shorter the delay, the more energy we're gonna save because the lights are turning off sooner. However, as I said earlier, occupant comfort. We don't want to annoy people by them working in their desk and then the lights come off and they got to wave their hands. And whatnot. So it's a fine balance. Uh, so occupied sensors shall be for warehouses, open office, uh, all other ones shall comply with the following. So everything I've been talking about except for warehouses or open office. Uh, so this is where I disagree with the this portion of the code, saying it's counterintuitive to turn the lights to full on if they're operating um, uh, procedure, but you're not supposed to do that, technically speaking. Okay, so when this, the lights are off and someone walks into a space, it's not supposed to come to full on, uh, except for the following spaces, uh, public corridors, stairways, restrooms, uh, primary building entrances, uh, lobbies or area where manual on would endanger the safety or security of the room we're building occupant. So there's another informal logic. That's up to you to decide for that last one. So they shall be manual or controlled to automatically turn on to not more than 50% of the power. Reason why I have a problem with this is that uh, how we measure lumens to watts uh, is not one-to-one -one across uh, the fixtures as far as code is concerned, because this is concerned with output. But the output of 50% fluorofluorescent versus an LED fixture is different. If those fixtures have been operating for 5, 10, 15 years, it's definitely different for the fluorescent. So that's one problem I have with it. The other one is with LEDs, a uh, high-end trim is becoming a default. It's not really a control strategy anymore. It technically is, but it's just part of the operation because LEDs are just so efficient and good at their job that we do end up by default reducing at 5, 10, 15%. And the 85% becomes the new 100 as far as occupants are concerned. So it's a fine balance. Um, typically, it shouldn't really be a problem with LEDs because most people can't tell the difference between dimming from 80% to 75%, like that small margin. It has to be a much more drastic uh, band for the human eye to visibly perceive it unless you are looking for it. Um, so warehouses. Uh, lighting in aisles, ways, or open areas shall be controlled with occupant sensors that automatically reduce the power by not less than 50% when the area is unoccupied. So for warehouses, you don't have to turn them, the lights don't have to go to off all the way. You can, but if it, an aisleway says no one's picking or no one's driving a forklift down an aisleway or whatnot, um, then uh, it needs to be dimmed to at least 50% of its output, okay? The reason for that is just perception. So building occupants have an emotional perception to what a space should be lighted to. So when you go into an open office area, you expect all the lights to be on, you know, uniformly lit, even though there's only three people in there versus 50, right? No matter what the, the time of day or condition is, you expect it to be lit that way. Same thing with warehouses. So uh, some people may not be emotionally ready or uh, prepared to handle just having random dark bays throughout the warehouse. It can kind of freak them out. Uh, in addition, um, you're going to treat each bay as its own independent zone, okay? So you can't have one occupant sensor at the end of the aisle control the aisle and then the connecting causeway between the aisles. Okay? Each one's independent. Uh, open office, uh, so spaces with less than 300 square feet shall comply with a different section. I'll get into uh, later on. Uh, anything other than that for open offices, that's uh, technically considered our other space type of open office. Uh, it needs to be controlled separately uh, in each zone that's being controlled in that open office space uh, cannot be greater than 600 square feet. Okay, So if you have a 
1500 square foot uh, open office building, you're gonna need at least three zones, 600, 600, 300. Now it's not to say you need three zones, you can break it down into four or five, however you want, but each zone cannot exceed 600 square feet. Uh, controls shall automatically, uh, for general lighting, not accent or um, display lighting, but general lighting, um, in all control zones within 20 minutes um, shall be turned off after no occupancy is detected. Uh, they shall be configured uh, so the lighting power in each control zone is reduced by not less than 80% of the full zone general lighting and a, re a reasonable illumination pattern. Uh, so that means you're basically dimming down to 20% output, minimum. You don't have to turn them all off because again, emotional perception of what people expect in the space. Uh, and we're just gonna basically take what we can get as far as energy efficiency is concerned. Uh, that's not to say that you can't go full off can, but the minimum is 20% of the output. And again, within 20 minutes. Uh, control functions that switch control zone lights completely off when the zone is vacant uh, meet this requirement. Okay. That's a time switch of base controls, but we'll be getting into that. Uh, and then control shall be configured such that any daylight responsive controls will activate open office plan um, space general lighting or the control zone. Um, so what that means is that daylight uh, harvesting takes precedence as or has authority over the occupancy sensor. So if the occupancy sensor comes in and it's only allowed to turn it to 50%, but the daylight photo control says, hey, we only need 30% output to meet the required illumination level, it's going to stop at 30%. It won't go to the 50. So next, we're going to get into time switch controls. Uh, if anyone has any questions on occupancy sensor controls. Uh, if you're online, you can type it in the chat or unmute yourself. Okay, time switch controls. So this is also broken down into three sections similar to occupancy controls. We have the definition of a time switch control, the functions of it, uh, and the required light reduction of the controls. So each area of the building that is not provided with occupancy controls compliant with section 405211 uh, shall be provided with time switch controls. So if you're not using an occupancy sensor, you're using a time switch control. Uh, time switch controls use time scheduling device to switch lighting systems on or off according to predetermined schedule, i.e. a lighting schedule. So this is one of the oldest forms of lighting control strategies. Uh, it's considered to be the least efficient now because of uh, the analog nature of it. Um, however, I'll get into building automation systems and how all that works. Um, basically, the digital version of it, it kind of works in concert with other um, building control systems. So exception, uh, where manual control provides light reduction in accordance to 405222, uh, control shall not be required for the following. Spaces where patient care is directly provided. Again, that's both logic and uh, informal uh, and validating. So you make the judgment call there, uh, but you will basically have to prove it. Um, spaces where automatic shutoff would endanger occupant safety or security. Again, informal logic. Uh, lighting intended for continuous operation, uh, shop and laboratory classrooms. So uh, controls can make sense in spaces that have a simple and predictable occupancy pattern. Uh, for example, circulation areas in school. We all know when you know first period gets out and when second period starts. So we know that's when everyone's gonna be moving throughout the building. Not necessarily that uh, people cannot move throughout the building when class is in session, but it's gonna be very limited. And so that's where we have our overrides um, take place. Uh, time scheduling for the most part relies on occupancy schedules. Uh, one of the reasons why it's becoming less efficient is because we're becoming more diverse with our buildings. So because we have buildings that have multiple uses, or space types into it, um, we can't really predict it all that well. Uh, we can't set up all those. In addition, we renovate buildings. Um, you know, they have uh, different space types and uses over the lifespan of them. So uh, the ideal scenario, uh, and this is basically what a, a lighting schedule is, is that uh, lights turn on when they arrive uh, and then they're set to an evening time to turn off, uh, to turn off automatically when everyone leaves the building. The uh, problem with that last one is you can't forget about the janitor maintenance and the extraneous uh, people that help the building operate because they're usually operating before everyone gets in as well as after everyone goes home. So our operating hours are actually longer, but that doesn't mean we have to have the entire building lit. 
you can have it reduced and only the parts that are needed. But again, it becomes a little more complicated. Uh, so time source controls uh, include central processor capable of controlling one to several output channels that may be assigned to one or more lighting circuits, uh, relays, series wired to lighting control zones and controlled by the central processor. This is very 90s analog lighting control style if you're not picking that up. Uh, override switches are required to accommodate individuals uh, who use the space during scheduled off hours. Uh, during those off hours, they can manually activate switches to override and regain control of the space. Um, the only place I really see this uh, used is in shops, uh, mechanical, uh, technical schools, like trade, uh, where students are coming in or you're working after hours and you need access. And so all the equipment, the, uh, the pressure, um, everything like that is keyed to the lighting control system. And so basically you push the button, turn on the lights, it overrides, and wherever the lights are activated, that bay, all the materials and equipments are also activated and have um, uh, whatever you need uh, going to them. So everything's kind of controlled. Uh, most effective where occupancy patterns are regular, are relatively regular, or where uh, lighting opera operating hours are easy to predict. Um, as I mentioned, this is the analog approach. Um, so new con most all, most if not all uh, new constructions uh, basically roll this into other parts of the, of the building control system. Uh, it's commonly referred to as the building automation system. This does lighting, occupancy, HVAC demand, um, things like that. Um, and so it's kind of just a, a sub feature of that. And uh, when I say building automation system, I don't mean like smart, like it's connected to the cloud, it can be programmed or whatnot. I'm talking about uh, backnet controls. So uh, lighting control infrastructure has shifted. So analog uh, devices are manually calibrated and tuned through the rotation of potentiometers i.e. Uh, alterations require rerouting of wires, modification of hardware, or more. So, and it relies just on predictions to react, and those predictions are very difficult to update. Uh, the digital version that we're shifting to operates on their software that can be alerted with um, select, uh, sorry, not alerted, altered uh, with select keystrokes. Alterations uh, can be packaged and uh, pushed to all or selected devices on the network or locally. Uh, standard predictions with on-demand reaction using logic, and those can be updated in real time. So much more flexible, giving you a lot more uh, wiggle room on how you want to design and have the, uh, the lighting space type meet the demands of your building occupants. And that can change over time. So uh, each space provided with time switch control shall be provided with manual control for light reduction in accordance to 405.222. Uh, basically, what it's saying is that it will have a minimum seven-day clock, be capable of being set uh, for seven days, uh, seven different day types per week, uh, and incorporate automatic holiday shutoff feature, which basically turns off all the lighting loads when it's Christmas, Thanksgiving, uh, etc. Uh, basically, this is the basic fundamental version of a lighting operating schedule, um, and the digital one can be far more complicated. Uh, especially with how we're using our, our buildings type, our buildings um, space type um, diversity as well as application. Uh, have program backup capabilities, which prevent the loss of program and time settings, not fewer than 10 hours if power is interrupted. Uh, include an override switch that complies with the following. Uh, override switch shall be manual. Override switch when initiated shall permit the control lighting to remain on for not more than two hours. So if you come in after hours and you're working and you turn on the lights, two hours passes, it should shut off. Uh, if you're using time switch control, occupancy is different. Uh, any individual override switch shall control the lighting area for not larger than 5,000 square feet or 465 square meters. So a lot of, a lot of lead room uh, with that one. Uh, the exception being mall concourses, auditoriums, cell areas, manufacturers, and sports arenas. Um, basically, it can be whatever the building owner uh, facility manager um, determines it to be. They don't have to adhere to the two-hour limit. Uh, the area controlled by the switch should not be limited to 5,000 square feet, provided that such area is less than 20,000 square feet. So they get a new cap. Because mall, mall concourses are very long, uh, sports arenas, auditoriums, things like that. Where provided with manual control, the following area uh, are not required to have light reduction control. Spaces that only have one luminaire rated with power less than 100 watts. Uh, spaces that use less than 0.6 watts per square foot, or corridors, lobbies, electrical rooms, and mechanical rooms. 
Uh, spaces required to have light reduction controls shall have uh, manual controls that allow the occupant to reduce the connected lighting load uh, in a reasonable uniform illumination pattern uh, by not less than 50%. So again, that's informal you determine what is a reasonable uniform illumination pattern. Uh, doing that shall be achieved by one of the following approved methods, uh, controlling all lamp or luminaires, dual switching of alternate rows, luminaires, alternate luminaires or alternate lamps, uh, switching the middle lamp of luminaires independently of the outer lamps. Um, so these kind of are directly applying to fluorescent uh, fixtures. It's directly tied to how we manufacture and operate uh, fluorescent based fixtures. Um, they typically come in two, three or four um, bulb types. And so dimming for it is you leave um, two full on and then you turn off the other two. So that's steps. That's the first um, version of dimming. Uh, and then we have continuous dimming uh, which is, you know, more prevalent with LED fixtures. Um, so if you're using fluorescent, please consider it an LED lighting type. But if you do, um, you'll have to do stepped um, dimming and have that capability. Uh, switching each luminaire or each lamp uh, is the last one. And then lighting reduction controls are not required in daylight zone, daylight responsive controls. So basically, again, daylight harvesting um, have, outranks all the other control strategies. Any question on time switch controls before we get into daylight responsive controls? Okay. So daylight uh, is broken up into four different sections. We're gonna talk about what the controls are, um, how they're supposed to function, and the different types of daylighting zones that code acknowledges. Uh, so uh, daylight responsive controls shall be provided to control the electric lights within daylight zones in the following spaces. This is really important. Spaces with a total of more than 150 watts of general lighting, not accent or display, uh, within side lit zones complying in with section 405.232. General lighting does not include, oh, yeah, right, sorry, I just said that. Uh, so the 150 watts is important. So depending on your window fenestration appointment for your skylights or your clear stories or whatever daylight strategy you're doing, you can manipulate the zone, how big it is, and how many fixtures fall within it for the total watts, as well as you can rearrange your lighting plan so that your fixtures could be less than 150 watts in your zones. Then you won't have to have daylight controls. Okay. But that, that's, a, you know, requires a little more planning um, and, and critical thinking uh, on that aspect. Uh, but same thing goes with top lit zones. So there's two zones, uh, the side lit and top lit. Um, I'll get into that in a moment. Uh, but same thing, uh, more than 150 watts of general lighting. So uh, exception, uh, controls for daylight response are not required in spaces for healthcare facilities where uh, case, patient care is directly provided. Uh, lighting that is required to have specific application controls for uh, 405.24. And side lit zones on the first floor above grade A2 or group M occupancies. Okay. So, uh, new buildings where the total connected lighting power calculated in accordance with 40531 is not greater than the adjusted interior lighting power uh, allowance calculated in accordance with equation 49. So, this is that equation. You have the LPD adjusted versus the LP um, uh, allowance normal. So, that normal is basically the value you're pulling from the table if you're doing the building area method. And if not, that's gonna be the sum for the space by space method that you calculate, okay? Uh, the one and 0.4 are constants. Sorry, I need to go to the next slide. That's probably helpful. Um, so the LP norm is the allowance in watts calculated in accordance and the sections that are referring to are the building area method, space by space method, uh, as well as the energy efficiency section in 406. It's the only time I'm going to leave uh, 405, I promise. But uh, basically, 406.1 requirements, uh, additional efficiency package options. So this is if you uh, want to do compliance uh, for a, a lead or a certification or a different standard you're doing. Uh, building shall comply with one or more of the following. Uh, list one, but in, in what we're referring to is number two. Uh, reduce lighting power in accordance with section 406.3. Uh, so basically, the total connected interior lighting 
uh, power calculated uh, in accordance shall be less than 90% of the total lighting power allowance calculated. So if you're doing that extra energy efficiency, you take what the normal value is and then you knock 10% of it off. So giving yourself just an extra hurdle to go over uh, if that is a requirement for you. Uh, the UDZ uh, ZFA is the uncontrolled daylight zone floor area, okay? So there could be some areas where you have daylight zones and you are required to have them controlled, okay? So those are not included in this calculation. However, uh, probably the first thing to do is just calculate all your daylight zones, figure out what that is and apply it for and apply it um, into this number and then go in and figure out which ones are absolute and which ones are optional. Uh, but basically uh, from there, and then you have the TBFA, the total building floor area is the sum of all the floor areas included in the lighting power allowance calculation, okay? So you have all the variables you need uh, you just have to go look up a couple of them and you plug them into that equation. And if it's less than your lighting power um, normal, then you don't have to have daylight responsive controls. Okay. Uh, the reason for that um, is lighting controls go off of our kilowatt hour pool. So say you have a building that uses 5,000 kilowatt hours for its lighting system, it's fluorescent, you know, commercial office, but then it does a retrofit for uh, LEDs then it's more of like 2,200 kilowatt hours. So, but you're taking 40% from that 5,000 and 40% from the 2,200 because your lighting control strategies are still the same. So you're saving far less, even though you're still using significantly less energy, your control strategies now, the rate of return has significantly declined while the technology sophistication, manufacturing costs have increased. So now it's starting to become a negative. So the future of lighting controls, in my opinion, is not about the kilowatt hour pool. It's about the operating um, uh, e efficacy of, of basically being able to connect all the building control systems throughout a commercial building, because that's everywhere. And that's particularly relies on luminary level lighting controls. And I have an entirely separate lecture for that to bore you with. Um, but the exception allows the option of reducing the power density in daylight areas by 40% in exchange for providing daylight responsive controls in those daylight areas. The 40% reduction is proportional to the daylight areas that can be made in any uh, area of the building to meet the average reduced interior lighting. So you're allowed to trade off, basically. Uh, in a number of cases, uh, basically what I was just coming with, uh, it's not becoming cost-effective because of how efficient our luminaires are becoming. And so, but keep in mind that if you're doing the offset and trading and, you know, basically getting a reduction for it, you're still going to be using, operating those fixtures, even though your code is allowing you to go under. So when you go to do an energy audit or whatnot, that's going to be a discrepancy you have to account for. Uh, where required, uh, daylight responsive controls shall be provided with each space uh, to comply with the following. Uh, lights in the top light zone in accordance to top light zone section shall be controlled independently of side light zones or uh, general zones, general lighting. Daily responsive controls within each space shall be configured so they can be calibrated from within the space by authorized personnel, i.e. commissioning. Uh, calibration mechanism shall be located with ready access. Ready access is actually defined in the code as readily accessible, which means that an occupant does not have to pull out a ladder and climb on the ladder to go use the light switch or move a box or something along those lines or whatnot. So they don't have to uh, exude any effort to operate the lights. Uh, we're located in offices, classrooms, laboratory, uh, laboratories, or uh, library reading rooms. Daylight responsive control shall dim continuously from full output to 15% of the full output. Uh, daylight responsive control shall be configured to completely shut off all controlled lights. So if there's enough daylight in the space and we don't need any electric illumination, they should be able to turn off. Uh, lights in silent zones. Uh, so basically for your silent zones, depending on your cardinal orientation, um, it is preferred if you do not use one uh, daylight sensor in the corner where east and west meet or east, south and southeast to control both those lights. So basically within 45 degrees, you're allowed some leeway because we know we orient buildings, um, not on true north. Uh, but basically the south facade should be independently controlled from the east facade to the west facade to the north facade, ideally. That's not always the case, but that is the preferred method. 
Um, that also helps if you're having one sensor control an area of light, so i.e. 10, 15, 25 fixtures, the daylight in one portion of the area is not going to be the same in the other part of the area. So, but it's affecting all of it. So depending on where you place your sensor is also very important for the operation of, of the fixtures. So, but please, cardinal rules, try to keep, you know, west, west, south, south, east, east. Uh, sorry, the exception, uh, up to 150 watts of lighting in each space is permitted to be controlled together with lighting in a daylight zone facing a uh, different cardinal orientation. So there's the exception for you. Uh, so let's get into a side lit zone. Where fenestration is located in a wall. That's very important. Fenestration in a wall. So that means window or clear story. Okay. Both technically fit that definition. Uh, shall extend laterally to the nearest full height wall or up to one point time or one one times the height from the from the floor to the top of the fenestration. So your top sill. Uh, and longitudinally from the edge of the fenestration to the nearest full height wall or up to two feet. Uh, the area of the fenestration is not less than 24 square feet. The distance from the fenestration to any building or geological formation that would block direct uh, access to daylight is greater than the height from the bottom of the fenestration to the top of the building or geological uh, formation. Uh, basically, you can't claim something's a daylight zone if it's going to be continuously shaded throughout the year. Okay. Uh, and the visual transmission of the fenestration is not less than 20% or 02 so here's what that looks like when I'm talking about. So let's see, is one out showing up? Hey, all right. So to get the height or H, we're gonna go from our floor and we're gonna go to our top sill. And we're gonna take that unit and we're gonna apply that and go into the space. Okay, that's our length. To get our width, we're gonna take the edges of our fenestration and we're gonna go two feet and we're gonna extend H, okay? Unless we run into a full height wall or partition. Then we stop and we draw around it. Yes. Are there tools in Revit or to just like? Not built in, but there are tricks and workarounds uh, for it. So typically what I'll do when I'm running a daylight simulation and I want to compare um, the daylight harvesting zones to my actual zones that I draw is I'll have this be a room and I'll go in with the, the room separator or room there's like you can basically draw a room within a room and so i'll have that and i'll have this you know window zone a1 you know that's that zone why not and i'll take that performance criteria and then i'll compare it against you know this is where i think the actual daylight is going uh because you know we do the daylighting design we want to make that uniform but we also want to do code compliance and make sure uh we're getting everything um as possible for the incentives and, and whatnot that the client is doing uh, but basically two feet to two feet. And so say these windows were a little bit closer together and they overlapped, right? You don't get to double dip. That becomes one zone. So right now where how this is drawn, these are two separate side lit daylight zones. Okay. Uh, next, let's talk about uh, top lit zone. Top lit zone refers to do two different type of fenestration assemblies. I'll get into that. Um, yeah, I think I'm just gonna go over the, the visual part to show you guys, because that's just a wall of text. So uh, the first one being the roof fenestration assembly, AKA a skylight, okay? So you're basically going to take CH is your ceiling height. So from your floor to your ceiling height. And so to determine the area uh, for it is 0.7 of your ceiling height, okay? So that's how you draw that area. And same thing applies for obstruction we're running into a wall or partition if it's greater than uh, 0.7 of the ceiling height. So 0.7 or higher, no good. I would imagine. Or no, less, sorry, less, my bad. On the slide before, probably said what the size of the skylight is, minimum size. Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, Or up to 0.25 times the height of the floor to the bottom of the fenestration, which is, uh, no, I think I have that. Yeah, I have that here. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Sorry. Um, so that's the daylight zone for, for the skylight. Um, and then we have rooftop monitor. Uh, and it's basically very similar. Um, so you're going to take the ceiling height 
and the height to the from the floor to the bottom of the rooftop monitor. Uh, and that's going to be your age for you extending into the zone. And again, uh, the 0.7 ceiling height uh, obstruction. And so, and so for the height is going to be used uh, for 0.25 for each for the sides. And of course, you'll notice with the rooftop monitor, we don't get anything behind it because it's directing light in one direction primarily. And so that's that's H. And so for that, uh, direct sunlight is not blocked from hitting the roof fenestration assembly at peak solar angle on the summer solstice by buildings or geological formations. Uh, the product of the visual transmission transmittance of the roof fenestration of the assembly area, uh, the rough opening of the roof fenestration assembly area, divided by the area of the hollow zone. Uh, so basically, we're trying to determine the effective aperture, which basically means don't make your skylight so small that it, it's, it's negligible. Um, so we have the visual transmission by the rough opening uh, divided by the uh, oplet zone area. And that'll give you your effective aperture. And that cannot be less than 0 0.008. I don't think I've ever had a problem complying with this one. No one's correct. You, ha you have to try to be out of compliance with this one, basically, to put it that way. Uh, any questions, or did I did that answer your question about the minimum size for the skylights? Not really. Uh, what was uh, what was it? Well, what's I'm assuming there's like a, a solar tube probably doesn't comply because it's only about twelve inches diameter. Mm -hmm. It's got a really deep throat to it. Yeah. So yeah, no, it, and this isn't uh, for solar tubes. That's one no. of the problems I have with it. Uh, it's just roof fenestration assembly, but you can clearly see by the diagram they're talking about skylights. Yeah. And so it does need to be updated to include solar tubes, especially yeah. with how more popular and efficient they are becoming. The, the um, one with the wall listed a size no smaller than 24 square feet or something like that. So yeah, for the, the like, silent zone. Yeah, it's kind of like something similar for a skylight. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have that for the, the skylight, sorry. Um, their, their version of that is this, which is basically like, if you're putting a skylight in, the chances are you're not going to make it, you know, very small or negligible and or kind of like, not make it big enough, essentially, <laughs> like because you're you're putting the investment in for the skylight. So clearly, you want to get your rate of return out of it. Hopefully, hopefully, ideally, <laughs> it's not always the case, unfortunately. Um, any questions on daylight responsive controls? Okay. Uh, yep. Does, um, so in 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 the code, and I think in general, right, when they're talking about um, kilowatt hours, they're they're referring to the year consumption. Or, or yeah okay so it's always a year so when they're talking about reducing it to 50 percent for like a rebate or something well, like that so kilowatt hours being how uh much energy the lighting system is using based off the building type occupancy hours okay so the operating hours um that could be and that's also loaded so like uh if you go with the default i think it's like 2800 or 2600 for like typical commercial office but that doesn't include people using the, the lights after hours before any special events or anything like that. So it's just, it's, so it's based it's, off a standard that it's depending on the type of building you have on the yeah, basis. It, it's a rough ballpark estimate. So then the, the, it gets pretty close. Cutting that like in 25% or 50% or whatever, is that essentially, uh, is that based off energy modeling or, or, or how do you arrive at an estimate of saying, oh, we saved so much? Uh, so it depends on who you're asking. Uh, for example, if you're asking Idaho Power, they have studies, they have commissioned or referenced uh, white papers. Um, who basically say you will save on average 13% using an occupancy sensor with this building type of this size or 23% or whatnot. Um, I know for the new L3 incentive, the luminal lighting controls, that's a percentage based off of your kilowatt hour reduction. Um, and so it's a more prescriptive requirement. So basically insert your value. This is what you get. Um, so yeah, and it depends on, on who you ask. Thank you. Uh, so specific application controls, uh, the following lighting shall be controlled by occupancy sensors complying with, is that right? Or time source controls. Oh yeah, right. Oh, okay. Uh, so anything outside of general lighting now, we're going to talk about, sorry. Uh, we're going to reference display and accents, uh, lighting and display cases, supplemental tax lighting, including permanently installed under the shelf or cabinet lighting. 
on lighting equipment that is for sale or demonstration in lighting education. So uh, sleeping units shall have control devices or systems that are configured to automatically switch off permanently install luminaires and switch receptacles within 20 minutes after op occupants leaving the unit. Uh, the exceptions are by key card or where uh, patient care is provided. So the key card basically hooked up with the building automation system knows when you're coming and going. And so that's the trigger for it. So uh, dwelling units shall be, oh yeah. So this is referring to the occupancy uh, sensors for um, residential units. Uh, basically saying you have to apply with 2.11 or 2.22, one or the other for it. That's it. Uh, lighting for non-visual applications, such as plant growth or food warming, shall be controlled by a time switch control complying with 221, which we, we went over, uh, that is independent of the controls for other lighting within the room or space. So basically, we're having our own independent lighting control systems within our broad general lighting control system. Depending on, it's very specific to building type and application. Um, so you, example, if, when you came into the building, you saw the, the, the display case in the lobby. That's, that's different, as well as the cam lights that um, line the elevator lobby. Those are different than the general lighting um, aspect. So it's just going into all that accent and display lighting um, that, we, that we do for our buildings. Uh, any questions on specific app? It basically, uh, if you're having a display case or a certain type of lighting, it will tell you which section of the occupancy time switch um, controls that it needs to comply with. Not all of them, just the one or two bullet points basically. Um, so that's where code kind of makes you jump around back and forth a lot. And not we'll get into manual controls. Uh, so required by the uh, code, manual controls for lights uh, shall comply with the following, uh, shall be in location with ready access for occupants. So again, uh, refer to the readily accessible definition. Uh, it's pretty easy to, to, to meet. Uh, and then I don't know how much longer um, that definition will hold because we're getting to the point where um, our phones and other devices, we have light remotes that we can walk around and that act as light switches, basically. Um, so that kind of changes uh, readily accessible depending on what system you're using. Uh, they shall be located where the control lights are visible or shall identify the area served by the lights uh, and indicate their status. Um, so basically, like an example over there, we have about five different slider rows on our light switch and each one you know will respond independently to each zone uh, so in this classroom we have five zones even though there's only two different lighting types so and we have like the the first ones up here let's see you guys can see the projector screen but then these guys do the uh the step dimming as well as continuous dimming so if you want a predetermined level or if you want to go directly uh, to a set to a set point uh that's basically the manual controls basically allow people to override um, the predetermined controls and use them. Uh, it's gotten more sophisticated with the continuous dimming and LED technology uh, and digital uh, interfaces that are being developed. Um, so yeah, any questions on that? No, okay. Uh, exterior lighting controls. Uh, so daylight shutoff, decorative lighting, a lighting setback and interior lighting uh, power requirements prescriptive. So exterior lighting systems shall be provided with controls that comply with sections uh, 261 to 264. Uh, decorative lighting systems uh, 261, 262, and 264, skipping the third one. Uh, lighting for covered vehicle entrances and exits from building and parking structures where required for eye adaptation. So I, uh, leaving the building or generally the first row of the parking area a lot, we want that to be illuminated. We don't want people to feel scared leaving the building. Uh, and lighting controlled within dwelling units. Oh, why did it do that? Uh, daylight shutoff. So lights shall be automatically turned off when the daylight is present and satisfies uh, lighting needs. So generally, uh, you can use a sensor or a photo control. Um, so one of the ways is you have a daylight sensor photo control um, on the outside of the building or on each light, and that will measure the luminance. Another way to do it is just by taking time of day, uh, depending on your geolocation. Uh, another method is if the exterior light has any photovoltaic um, power for it, it can monitor the performance of that uh, panel. And when it gets to a certain point, it's okay, well, the sun's not out anymore because we're not getting any energy, shut off that way. So there are multiple ways to comply with that. 
um, depending on your manufacturer and the lighting fixture that you select. But basically, uh, when daylight is present, uh, uh, it can automatically turn off or turn on if it needs to. Decorative lighting shut off. So building facade and landscape lighting shall automatically shut off from not later than one hour after business closing to not earlier than one hour before business opening. So basically, you know, don't light the building. No one's going to be there to look at it, just wasting energy. Um, but, you know, there is some accident lighting, emergency lighting that kind of just stays on continuously no matter what. Um, that's understandable. And it's not really too much of an issue now with LEDs and how efficient they are um, that we can afford to do that. Uh, lighting setback, uh, lighting that is not controlled in accordance with 405.262 shall be controlled so that the total wattage of such lighting is automatically reduced by not less than 30% by selectively switching off or dimming luminaires at one of the following times. So uh, from not later than midnight to not earlier than 6 a.m. So that time light should be off or at least uh, be reduced um, to not less than 30%. Uh, from not later than one hour after business closing to not earlier than one hour um, before business opening, okay? So you don't have to turn off all your lights, but I recommend it. And the ones that you do leave on for emergency egress um, apply by not less than 30%. Uh, during any time where activity has not been detected from 15 minutes or more, i.e. allow the occupancy sensor or the building lighting control system to work after hours as normally as it should. Uh, exterior time switch control functions. Uh, they shall comply with the following. Uh, basically, have a clock being basically the same for the interior, just for the exterior. Um, so not fewer than seven days of um, uh, day types. Um, set seven different day types, uh, not fewer than seven days. Shall incorporate automatic holiday setback feature. Um, shall have program backup capabilities present for this program and time setting for a period of not less than 10 hours in the event that power is interrupted. So uh, that's all I got for you guys um, for this first half. I ran on time, three minutes. Um, I got some thoughts for the, the second half. I don't know how much if you guys give me feedback. It's my first time lecturing on the lighting code section itself. Um, so I remember that uh, second. There should be a poll. Where's the poll? I had a poll. Oh, that's sad. Oh, wait, there's one. All right, sorry. So uh, online, there's a poll. If you could please fill it out, give me feedback. I appreciate it. Um, but basically, uh, perceived brightness, I, I see that a lot when I when I go to buildings to evaluate them. People are not aware of, of what that is. Um, so I think that might be helpful. But also, um, would a logic-based worksheet or a step-by-step -step process for how to move through the code or compliant be helpful? Or would like uh, example-based problems help you understand the control requirements? Because the, the second half of it is gonna get into the lighting power allowance, um, lighting power density calculations, things like that. So it's using a lot of equations, referring to code and, and whatnot, and you know, uh, different building types present different scenarios, uh, especially diverse multi-use buildings. Um, so if you think that would be helpful, please let me know, um, and I'll start to develop something like that. But if not, that's, uh, that's all I got for you. So any questions or comments, I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. LLCs help simplify things, right? Uh, yeah. So basically think of, you know, all the things I went through that you have to go through, check, monitor, understand. If your building was just using LLCs, luminar level lighting controls, then all that gets kicked down to commissioning because you you're still have to tell the commissioner how to commit, like how you want your lights commissioned, what the space type is, what the foot candle is, what the occupancy setting is, wide, narrow, right? So you're still doing all of that. But now you only have to do that if you're using luminar level lighting controls. So think about the, the time cost savings from that, as well as stress of not really having to go through the code so much. Uh, and you said that there's a second part to your lecture. Um, yes, that is and, next week. All right. One and week from today. You know, yeah. one thing that I, I think would help, I mean, it was helpful when you show the graphics, right? Showing, okay, this is the height, this is what the H means, this is the space. Um, 
I think uh, one part that I particularly have a, a hard time understanding is the exterior lining requirements. Some of them are area, some of them are linear, and, and then adding the, the facade I, as well, you know, um, kind of determining why each space, some example of why each space will be cataloged as would be, would be helpful, at least to me. So do you mean like showing you elevations, floor plans, or do you mean like having a rabbit model open and going through it? And well, floor plans, really. I mean, like a side plan that shows, you know, uh, this is path and it's linear, right? Paths are linear, right? For exterior. Sorry, what? The, the paths, walking paths for exterior lighting, the allowance is done, it's calculated by the linear length of the path. Um, I will get into that next week. Okay. Well, it's not like that. I think it's... Uh, I, I need to like open it and have the equation in front of me to be able to answer that. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's the other thing about code is, you know, you're not going to really know it fully inside and out. So, you know, have the both open reference it. Don't, you know, try to remember or make a judgment call. Like, what does code say? And if it is the informal part of code, then, okay, then you know you have free range to, you know, use contextual decision making. Because um, you are a designer, mechanical or architect, you are a designer, uh, and you're trained and educated for that. Code is meant to assist you, although at times it doesn't feel like that, but that is the intention of code. Graphics are really helpful. It graphics, all, okay. Always. I guess that's what it comes it's out to graphics. graphics, okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, so I think the uh, the work example-based problem would probably be more suitable. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.